Raise your hand if you were ever uh, the kind of person. No, don't just raise your hand. There's an if, bro. You got to wait out. Raise your hand if you were the kind of person uh, that did uh, like summer, summer camps throughout the summer where you went away and you, I got, no, raise them high. Come on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So we got like 40% of the room. All right. I feel I'm not, I'm not alone here. Oh, well, I was growing up. I went to a camp uh, called Camp Don Lee. Maybe you've heard about it. Maybe you have, maybe you've been. No, nobody's been. All right, cool. It's just like up the road. You been? Oh, word. Sweet. Oh, you went in school probably for like a field trip. Yeah. We went to the same, we grew up in the same town. Anyway, we went, uh, I used to go every week or not every week, every summer for a week. Uh, as I got older, I did one that was, that was two weeks long and I would, I would grow, I would go and I would learn really, uh, really important life lessons. I learned how to ask a girl to a dance, um, which is, they had a dance like on Friday night, which was, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was unsuccessful, but, but I asked the question, you know, uh, I, I, I had the courage to ask the question. I learned how to sail, uh, which I don't sail now. So uh, I learned how to dissect um, a frog. So I learned a lot of things that I don't use now uh, whatsoever. Um, but one thing that happened every single year, I would go, I would come back. Uh, or I would go and it would be like Saturday, halfway, halfway through Saturday, midday Saturday, I'm all packed up. My mom would come, she'd pick me up, I would say goodbye to people and we would go off home. And like 30 minutes into the trip, uh, something happened to me and the, this, there would be like pressure building up behind my eyes and then this liquid would start coming forward to the front and it would start falling down my face and I would just start crying because I had built like these really, really close connections with people, like these real friendships with people while I was away and I was with them all week long nothing, nobody, with nobody else but these people. And then all of a sudden I was ripped away from them. Like my mom came and yanked me from them. And it was just like before, like I didn't have a phone. This is like early 2000s. So like you guys were like one year old. So I didn't have a phone. We didn't even have, like Facebook wasn't a thing yet. So it was really like MySpace was the thing, but I wasn't old enough and my mom wouldn't let me have a MySpace. So I didn't have any way of staying connected with these people. I didn't have any way of staying uh, in a relationship with these people. And so that, that hurt my heart there. Uh, some of you guys have seen me in this. Uh, I never really grew out of it. Some of you guys have seen me in this state of mind. If you've been to something we call College Serve Week, we've done it two years in a row where it's like the, the funny thing now where you come on Saturday afternoon and you get to see me cry because, uh, yeah, ha ha ha. So you get to see, you get to see me cry because I've just built these like relationships with you guys and we've been nothing but working alongside one another, praying alongside one another, sharing the gospel with one another. And you just build these, these friendships with one another and, uh, and it hurts when it's the end and you got, you gotta, you gotta leave and go. And for, for even for, for serve week, it's really crazy because it's Saturday afternoon, which means I see you guys tomorrow. Like it's, I see you guys again. What? I still don't have MySpace. Well, I still don't have MySpace, but I have other, I have a phone now. I'm like a full, like a whole adult. So I have a phone. I've got, I have Facebook. I don't get on Facebook. I've got Instagram. Like I've got ways to communicate with you guys and stay connected with you guys. But I didn't back when I was when I was just going through these these summer camps, uh, and it would have been really incredible for me if I'd have if I would have known a way that I could stay connected with these people that I had built these great relationships with. And as we as we move on into the second week of our series, we're going to move into John chapter 15, and we're going to look at the first six verses of John chapter 15, where Jesus is talking to his disciples and. They need a message much like I wish I could have received a message uh, back in my, my middle school, my elementary school days. They're, they're hearing from Jesus uh, that he's leaving them. In John 14, he tells them that he's going, he's going to die, he's going to be crucified, and that he's, he's going to be ascending and, and, and leaving them. And so they're, they're distraught. And they're like, well, we have spent three years, just, just three straight years, not just a week like me, but three straight years ministering and learning from and learning under and growing to be more like Jesus for three years. 
And so now they're hearing that he's going to be gone and they need some, they need a pick me up. Like they need an encouragement. And so in John 14, he tells them this, but then he tells them the spirit's coming in John 14. But then he continues to encourage them and tell them that he, they are actually going to be able to stay connected to him even after he leaves. And he uses this imagery of vines and branches and a, and a gardener that's going to take care of, of all of it. And he tells them that he's not just going to be watching them like a shepherd or guiding them like a father, but that they can actually remain intimately connected with him in a relationship. That if they abide in him or remain in him, just as he was abiding with the father when he was on earth, uh, then there will be a real true connection that they can have with Jesus even after he dies. And for you and me, like we never even had that, right? We never had the the walking alongside Jesus incarnate in the flesh while he walked the earth. And so we don't know what it feels like to, to be with him three years and then have him leave. But we can know what it's like to still have an intimate, life-transforming relationship with him. Because we do it the same way that he was telling the disciples to do it in John 15. So as we move uh, forward with this series where we're going over uh, the mission of this college ministry, uh, which is, you can see right there, to cultivate a biblical worldview and an intimate life transforming relationship with Jesus. We go from week one where we talked about a biblical worldview, cultivating a biblical worldview now to week two where we're talking about cultivating an intimate life transforming relationship with Jesus. Last week, we looked at week one, cultivating a biblical worldview, and we saw three things uh, from our text out of 2 Corinthians, that it's realized in a mystery, that it's received through the Spirit, and that it's recognized by our actions. It's realized in a mystery, which is the mystery message of the gospel. We realize uh, that we can have a biblical worldview when we start with the foundation uh, of the gospel message. Second, it's received through the Spirit when we've been given the gift of faith and we see the message for what it truly is, that it is truth, then we receive the Spirit and we're able to understand spiritual truths that God communicates through His Word. And then lastly, it's recognized by our actions, that we don't just have this and it doesn't just stay in our head, it doesn't even just stay in our hearts, but it can be seen by the world and it's played out in how we treat Jesus, how we treat other people, and how we treat ideas that the world has. And now the teaching that Jesus gives to his disciples in John 15 opens our eyes to how and why we should cultivate our second part, which is a relationship with Jesus. And the ultimate reason is that a relationship with Jesus transforms you. A relationship with Jesus is transformational. It will transform you. And so as we spend time in John 15, these first six verses, uh, like I already said, Jesus is preparing his disciples for life after the death that he has predicted and he wants to challenge them, but he also wants to encourage them. And so my prayer for all of us tonight, my prayer for you guys tonight, is that we would be also challenged and encouraged uh, by the words that, that Jesus proclaims to his disciples and that he continues to proclaim through the Spirit to all of us in this room. Uh, so let's look at John chapter 15. Like I said uh, last week, the words will be on the screen. But if you have a copy of your paper Bible, I encourage you uh, to look there. Or if you look on your phone, however you do it. John 15, it's them red letters. Jesus is talking. I'm just joking. He talks through all of it. But <clears throat> he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. And every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that does produce fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Now remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. Now, if anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch and he withers. And they gather them, they throw them into the fire, and they're burned. Will you pray with me uh, as we ask the Lord to, to work in us through this text, that he would apply it to our heads, apply it to our hearts, uh, and apply it to the rest of our lives. Lord, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you uh, that you are the kind of God who 
who speaks to us and talks to us and communicates to us. We thank you for your spirit uh, that you have sent down into the world, uh, that we would be able to understand spiritual things. And we ask that you speak uh, through your spirit, through your word, uh, and communicate to the spirit uh, that lives in us as sons and daughters, uh, that we can understand your truth. And uh, we ask that you move this truth from our head down deep into our hearts, that it builds roots for our lives, uh, and that it transforms, as you promise your word does, it transforms those uh, who hear it and adhere to it. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our brother, and our friend. Amen. All right, so <clears throat> a relationship with Jesus transforms you. And I think there are four ways we can see in this passage uh, that it transforms us. And the first way is that our, uh, a relationship with Jesus transforms you by refining you. A relationship with Jesus refines us. I'll read again the first two verses. He says, I am the vine, the true vine. My father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that does produce fruit so that it will produce more fruit. Like we said last week, we want you to flourish in this ministry. That's why, that's why that's our mission statement. We want you guys to flourish through a biblical worldview and an intimate, life-transforming relationship with Jesus. And God wants you to flourish. And God knows best how to challenge you because He created you and He created the world that you live in and you move in and you breathe in. So our first verse here, as we think about the refining work of, of God, is that it's just telling us who's doing the work. He says, I'm the true vine, so Jesus, I, am the vine, but my Father is the gardener. Maybe if you're reading out of ESV, I think it says He's the vine dresser. He's the one who, who cares and cultivates us, which really should be an encouragement, right? It's that, that God is in charge of the refining process in our life. Because how many times have we, just maybe this week or in this last week, if you're in school, you went all through and you just saw the syllabus and you saw all the books you got to read and you saw all the, the exams you have to take and you saw all the projects you have to complete. You saw all the time you have to spend in class and in labs and you get stressed out and you're like, man, that's a lot on my plate. And then you go to church and maybe, maybe you serve, maybe you get an email from me and you're like, man, that's a lot, that's a lot that I have to do. Or maybe you work and you get a call from your boss and he's like, hey, I'm going to need you to pick up some more shifts this season since we had a lot of other people leave for college. Right? There's a lot of things that get put on our place. We start getting stressed. We start getting anxious. I was going to ask you to raise your hand if you felt that way in a month. But how many of you have felt that way like just in the last week that there's just too much on? Oh, my gosh. That's more hands than summer camp. That's like every hand almost. It, that's how we feel. See, we're not alone in, the, in this group. We're never alone. We, we feel anxiety. We feel stress. There's just we put so much on our own plates. And some people put things on our plates for us and we can get weighed down with this. How, how much more stressful if we were completely in charge of our own spiritual growth, our own sanctification, if, if nothing, if nobody else cared for us and it was all up to us for our eternal life. That would be exhausting. That'd be, that's, so this is one less thing that we have to worry about. And it's not supposed to be it's not supposed to communicate that, that God is some puppeteer and he's got us on strings, so he does everything for us. It's done symbiotically. There are things we do. We move and God moves and the spirit provokes us to move and, and God uh, prunes us in, in these ways. But the point is meant to be an encouragement that, that Jesus is the true vine, but the father is the gardener. The father is the one, is the one uh, that, is, that is doing the work in us. And is there really anybody else that we would choose to do the refining work in us other than the one who created us, the one who knows everything about us and the one who created the world and knows everything about the world? Like you wouldn't want, unless your father's like a surgeon, you wouldn't want your father, you wouldn't want like your dad doing, I didn't think that all the way through. You don't want your dad doing like your open heart surgery, right? You'd want a medically trained professional doing your, your open heart surgery. You wouldn't want a stranger off the street uh, doing your root canal. Right? You'd want a, an endodontic. I bet there's one, one person in this room that knows what an endodontic is. But it's a root canal professional. Am I right? Yes, right. You would want them, the people who specialize in this, the people who know more about this than anybody else, you would want them doing the work on you. How much more your spiritual life? Something that has eternal ramifications. You'd want the Father who created you to be the one 
molding you and shaping you and refining you. So not only do we see who is doing it, he tells us how he is going to do this. It's really simple, right? If there are areas of your lives that are not producing fruit, bye bye to those areas. And if there are areas of your life that are producing fruit to the glory of God, then he snips a little here, plucks a little here, feeds a little here, waters a little here, and he prunes you to be more fruitful in this life. He's just coming in and he's removing the unproductive areas of our lives. And a lot of times this looks like something really difficult. This looks like discipline. Think of chapter 12 in Hebrews verses 10 and 11, where it says he disciplines, this is the father, he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. He's refining us. Now, all discipline for the moment seems not to be so joyful. Amen? Yeah, I've been there. But sorrowful. Yet, to those who have been trained by it, afterwards, as you look back, it yields the peaceful fruit, there's that fruitfulness again, of righteousness. When we have a relationship with Jesus, our productivity and our purpose is transformed. We have his loving, pruning work. Now, last week, you guys got to hear uh, the difficulty and the struggle that I have in growing things outside of my house like the last two years. Today you get to hear that that difficulty is not new in my life. It has been the same for five years ever since Kay and I got married, or almost five years in March. We've tried to grow all kinds of things in our house. We've tried to grow like many different flowers, a bunch of different plants. They all die. None of them can remain. We have one plant in our house that has actually had a sustained life. And I'm pretty sure now, I'm starting to think that it was really just a plastic plant that was gifted to us and they just put it in real soil. Kelly got us a plant like three years ago and that thing is, is still alive. It still looks as good as ever. And I'm pretty sure it's, uh, it's fake. I don't think it has any, any like root, root, is real? Okay, all right, because everything else dies. So I don't know how that went. She did her research then and found the one plant that you cannot kill. And so that's the one, like, we don't have it in sunlight. We forget to water it for weeks, maybe like months. And it's, it's, still, it's still there. It's still, it's still green as ever. So she did her, her research. But there's one plant that I'm supposed to be in charge of. I told Kay, like, early this spring, I was like, we need more plants in the house. We need some greenery. I think it's supposed to be good for the air. Uh, so I was like, we need our house healthy air. And so, because I forget to change the filter a lot. That's a different thing. But I was like, I like, we, yeah, that's, that's, off, that's off to the side. <laughs> Fire hazard, I know. But so she got, she did some research and I like the like the hangy plants, the ones that like viney looking things, they, they flow down. So she got me something called baby tears. Is that right? Baby tears. Are they baby tears? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So she got me baby tears. I was like, dang, this plant looks cool. Uh, well, within a month, half of it was black. Half the plant was completely, completely dead. And then when I tried to pull like the dead ones out, there was, it was so thick full of dead ones. It started uprooting like the ones that were good. So I had to, so over the, since like May, which is when I got the plant. So maybe since like June, I've been meticulously taking care of this plant. Cause I was like, not another one's going to die on my watch. Cause before I could blame Kaylee. Cause I was like, it's not my plant. This one's my plant. So now I have to, I have to make sure this thing is, is alive. So I've got it set up for just some, some partial sunlight, like a part of the day. And then I've been watering it. And Lisa taught me some stuff about how you, you, f you feel in the dirt and if it's wet. Cause apparently I was over watering. I was drowning that sucker. So if you feel, if you feel in the water, if, if it's a little wet, you need some more water. And then I've got some Lisa approved uh, food, for a little inside houseplant food that I, put, that I put in there like every other week or, or once a month. And so I got, I got this thing going and I've, I have figured out this plant is alive now. It's still only the half because the other half is just straight dead. Uh, but that, the one half though is still, still green. It's growing longer too. So I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing something right now. I've figured out how... Uh, how to prune, right? I have gotten the old stuff out of it. Thank you, thank you. I figured out how to keep this plant alive and dare I say, on the road to flourishing. It's, it, it is getting there. And that's the picture of what, of what the gardener does in our, our lives, our spiritual lives. He, he takes what is not working, 
He takes the things that are not producing fruit, the dead branches in our lives, the things that we're given our time to, the things that we're given our energy toward, the things we're given our resources toward. He takes those things that are unproductive in our lives and he removes them. And sometimes it, look, it feels really hard. Sometimes it's discipline. It, it, it hurts sometimes the things that we go through. But if we look back, if you give it enough time and you look back, you'll realize that it is yielding something good for you because he loves you. It is yielding something that brings glory to him and it's good for you because he promises that for those who love him. So he's doing that and then he's putting that plant food in there. He's watering it when he needs to, the good things in your life that are producing good fruit for him. So our application just from these first two verses, what God is, is challenging you to do tonight from these verses, the first is to look at Jesus. Look at Jesus and compare Compare your life to his. We don't compare our lives to anybody else, but we can compare our lives to Jesus because we are called to be transformed into the image of the Son, Jesus Christ. So look at Jesus. James, in, uh, in the first chapter of, of his letter, he talks about looking at God's word, which, which calls and corrects and, and convicts us. And he says, when you look, it's like looking in a mirror. You see what, what you ought to be, what you're supposed to be. You see the things that, that, that aren't quite right about your life as you juxtapose it with Scripture and the calling God has for you. But the problem is sometimes we look at God's Word and we look in the mirror and we see the things we need to change. We see the areas of our life that need pruning. But then we go away from God's Word and we forget what we just saw. And it says it ought not be like that. We should remember the areas that we need to shape and, and to mold and to be, to be refined. So first, look at Jesus and see the ways that you need uh, maybe to be disciplined, to be, to be uh, refined, to be pruned. And then second, I would say, this is for encouragement, look at your calling. Look at the calling that God has put on your life and see where you're hitting the mark. See where you're making it. See where you are walking in faithfulness and let that be an encouragement to you. Let that be an encouragement as you have lived faithfully, as you've walked with God, as you've been in step with the Holy Spirit. See where you don't need, you don't need that pruning work or you don't need, you don't need that, that removal, that discipline, but where you just need maybe a little more water, where you need to, to water that area of your life some more or provide some, some healthy food for that area of your life some more so you can continue to bear even more fruit in that direction. And I would encourage you to do the same for those at your table or for those in your small group, or for those that, that are here in this room that you know. Look at their life and see the way that they are also hitting the mark and be an encouragement to one another. Share that with them at some point this week and say, hey, I see you are, you are living faithfully. I see that God has called you in this way and you're actually walking in that. And that is an encouragement to me. And I just want to praise the Lord for his work in your life. So there's two areas, right? The areas that we need to continue to grow in because we're already bearing fruit. The areas we need to remove. And lastly, pray to the gardener. Pray to the father. Pray that he would reveal to you maybe things that, that you don't see, right? We all have blind spots. We all have areas in our lives where it's hard to see. And so that's a hard prayer to pray. Hey, God, discipline me. I like, mm. don't know if I always want to pray that prayer, but it's a good prayer. It's a, a healthy prayer. It's a righteous prayer. And so pray to the gardener that he would reveal to you the areas that you need pruning, the areas uh, that you need a little bit of work in. And I would even say, join a small group or get into a community of people who are willing to be honest with you, like bluntly honest with you and point those things out and give people permission to speak into your life in that way. So first, a relationship with Jesus refines us. Secondly, a relationship with Jesus purifies us. It purifies us. We can look in verse three when he says, you are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. He purifies us when he says, you're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Those first two verses are about things that are, that are ongoing. The first two verses are things that, that continue to happen in our life on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis over the course of our lives. He continues to do these things when we stay connected to him. This verse is talking about something that has already happened, right? Look at the past tense. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. It's a call to remember the work of God in our lives. It's a reminder of what God has already done in transforming your life. If you've submitted to God, 
If you've believed in the truth that Jesus, the Son of God, lived a perfect life, died a horrible death on the cross, undeserved, that he was buried and on the third day he arose from the grave and eventually ascended into heaven. And if you believe that you do not live up to the holiness of God, that you actually you, you miss the mark, that you are sinful uh, by nature and by action, by choice. But if you believe in the work that Jesus did on the cross, the shedding of his blood, if you believe in who he is and what he has done, believe in that message, then you can receive the, the eternal life that he earned, the eternal life that he rewards to those uh, who believe him. If you receive the love that he pours out on us and you love him in return, then you have been cleaned because of the truth of the word that Jesus spoke to you in the message of the gospel. God's word condemns sin, it inspires holiness, and it promotes growth in our lives. Just this past week, I was, it was Thursday, which I get kicked out of the house on Thursday because my wife has a small group. And so I went to work out and I came back and it was, it was super rainy. And so I was like, well, oh, I got, you know, I'm under half a, t half a tank. I'll get some gas. So I pull into the gas station and uh, it, the wind is whipping. So like I'm under the carport, but I'm still getting rained on. I'm like, what the heck, man? So I'm, pull, I'm starting to pump some gas and I see this dude come in and he pulls in. He's in this beat up truck. He pulls in and he parks like kind of like near a gas pump, but like, the gas can is actually on the opposite side of his truck. So there's no way he's actually getting gas. And there's this high school kid, I think he's a high school kid, on the other side. And he hops out and he goes and talks to this high school kid. And I was like, man, this kid doesn't want to talk to this guy. Like, there's no, like what is, he's, he's bothering this kid. I was like, poor kid. He goes and he talks to the kid and then I'm done. And so I'm trying to hurry up. I'm like, okay, just get the last thing in. And so I, whatever, I already paid. I was like, no receipt, no receipt. And I, I turn around and then I see him walking my way and I'm like, dang it, <sighs> he got me too. And so he walks up to me and I was like, what's up, man? And he says, hey, I just want to give you this. And it was a, a gospel track and an invitation to his church. And he said, hey, I live in Sneeds Ferry. I don't know if you're ever up in the Sneeds Ferry area. I don't know what he was doing down here, but I don't know if you're ever up in the Sneeds Ferry area. Uh, but I would love to have you come by our church. And he starts telling me uh, about God's purifying work in his life. And he starts telling me uh, about how the gospel has transformed him. He shares his testimony with me. And I stay there 20 minutes talking to this guy. Uh, Kay was like, text me, hey, you're allowed to come home now. But I was, I was having a, a good time talking to this man. We both shared our testimonies. Um, and uh, I have to say it was a little convicting because I, I didn't assume the best of this man. I assumed, I assumed the worst and I was going to get aggravated. Uh, but it was, it was such a, a good, his name is Jack. It was such a good uh, moment uh, in, in, for my soul, honestly, that, somebody, that I would see somebody living their faith out, man. He was, he was constantly reminding himself and even others about the purifying work that had happened in his life because of his relationship with Jesus. And as I left, I saw him, uh, he didn't hop back in his truck. He went over and he went to the next person that was there and the next person that was there. Well, I don't know if the next person, because I put out, but he went to another person and he gave them a track. I saw them and he was sharing his faith. Uh, and it was just a call. It was a reminder to me that I need to constantly remember the work that God did in my life. Because sometimes I even thought about it in the back there as we, were, as we were singing a song about our old life and our new life. Sometimes I forget my old life. Sometimes I forget like, where I was and how God uh, has brought me to this place, how, how he purified me uh, uh, in that day when I was 22 years old in college at UNCW um, and, and how he has, he has brought me and pruned me and refined me even to this day. And so uh, we should always constantly be Remembering, I think the application for our lives is to constantly remember the work of God in our lives. First, first we have to, we have to run to Him. We have to run to Jesus. Uh, if we don't already have this purifying work, if you're out there and you're like, man, I don't know if I've been purified. I read, we read Romans chapter 6, those, those two, first two verses. I, I, I think that's how I'm, I'm still living. I'm not sure if I have that, that Romans 22, 6, 22, Romans 6, 23. I don't know. If, if the wages for my sin have been, have been paid for me, uh, run to Jesus and, and the, the, the offer of eternal life uh, that he gives you through the shedding of his blood. And then if you have, though, remember Jesus. Remember that moment because it's, it is fuel for your soul as you continue to live this life. So a relationship with Jesus transforms you. Number one, it refines you. 
Number two, it purifies you. And then thirdly, a relationship with Jesus enables you. A relationship with Jesus enables us. We see in verses four and five, he says, remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself, unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. And I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. Without a relationship with Jesus, it's not that flourishing in this life is just hard. It's not that flourishing in this life is difficult. It's not that flourishing in this life may just take a little extra effort or extra energy. If you are not in a relationship with Jesus, flourishing in this life is something that you are unable to do. Now, you may be able to flourish in ways that the world defines flourishing, right? You can be successful in the way that the world defines success. But if you want to live a life of flourishing the way God has created you to live, the way God knows that you can live, you cannot do that if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you don't remain connected with Him. And so Jesus encourages His people to stay in close connection to Him. As close as is is possible, right? He says, remain in me. I actually do like the way the ESV says it when it says to abide in him. It's this constant state of, of mutual being with one another. There's never a separation. It's not like, oh, well, I'll be with Jesus in my quiet time uh, and then I'm going to go be with myself. And then I'll, I might, you know, I got a test coming up and so I'll say a quick prayer, got to get, got, got attached to the vine again and then, oh, all right, I'm going to disconnect now and do something else this weekend or, or tonight. Like, there's a constant state of being connected to God. And it's this that allows you to produce fruit, right? The one who does remain in me and I in him produces much fruit. That's a truth statement. That's a promise. You remain in Jesus, you're going to produce much fruit. But you can't expect to produce any fruit. You can't expect to develop any maturity in Christ if you're not connected with Him. Connection with God transforms us so that we are enabled to bear fruit. In fact, it will be impossible for you to be fruitless. You may not have the same fruit as somebody else. Or it may look different. You may not have the same abundance maybe as you compare yourself to other people, which you ought not do, but you will bear fruit in this life and it will strengthen your faith in God. There's an old missionary. His name is Herbert Jackson. Maybe you've heard of him. Maybe you haven't. Uh, but he went, he had his missionary assignment. He went there and they uh, had given him a car. They were going to gift him a car and they said, hey, this car is free. You don't have to pay for it, whatever. Uh, and, you know, they made like no money back then. So your car is free, but it doesn't start. It, you, have to, you have to give it a little something to start. You have to give it a, a push. Like you're going to have to do this yourself. And so he figured out a way. He figured out a way. He lived next to a school. So he asked the teachers, hey, can I get some of the kids at the beginning of school to come early in the day to get out of class and just push my car so it starts so I can get on my way? Because he would go to different towns, go to different cities, he'd minister to people, he'd share the gospel with people. And they were like, sure. So he had this system set up where every day some of the kids would come out, they'd push his car and he would drive to different towns and he would either leave the car running or he'd park on the, the downslope of a hill. And so he would get in his car, he'd release that brake, it would kind of start rolling and he'd be able to start the car. Well, after two years, he got pretty sick uh, and so he had to, he had to leave. Uh, he and his family had to leave. So a new missionary came in town. He got the assignment. And he was talking to this guy about how this car was going to work. He gave him all his missionary things. And he was like, but this car now, it, it doesn't really, it doesn't have the, the power to run. Like, you're going to have to do, you're going to have to do some work. And so he was telling him, I got these kids, man. You're going to be set. They're going to do this. I know all the best areas to park. It's going to go downhill. And as he's talking to this guy, the guy pops open the hood. And he looks down at the car. He was obviously... Uh, more savvy than Herbert Jackson. And he looks down and he sees, oh, there's just a disconnected wire. There's just a loose connection here. So he takes both of his wires, he twists them together, he turns around, goes inside, uh, and he starts the car and it fires, it fires right on up. And so for two years, 
this Herbert Jackson had been making a, a mess out of this whole situation. He had so much unnecessary effort put in, so much unnecessary struggle uh, and strife and trouble that he had just made routine in his life. When the power was there the whole time, the connection just wasn't there. I think it's far too often the same in our lives. We try to live this Christian life. We try to do the things that we're called to live. We try to live the way that God wants us to, and we're doing it in a powerless state. We're doing it without the power because we're not remaining connected to Jesus. And he says, if you stay connected to me, like you're going to bear much fruit. I am going to empower you. It reminds me of Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 18 and 19, really 19, but... The the whole thing is, and he's praying this to the Ephesians. Paul writes this as his prayer to the Ephesians, uh, but the prayer is really for anybody who is reading. So it's for us this evening. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you can know. What does he want us to know? Three things. He wants us to know the hope of his calling, so the hope that God calls us to, that Jesus calls us to. What's the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints? So what we have to look forward to for eternity What are we going to inherit? And then he says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength? Like we have an immeasurable greatness of power from the from the source, from Jesus that is given to us who believe. And sometimes we forget that. So that's my prayer tonight as well, that that our hearts would be enlightened so that we can know, the eyes of our heart can start to see the reality that there is immeasurable greatness of Jesus' power toward us. And all we have to do is stay connected to Him. All we have to do is abide in Him. All we have to do is remain in a relationship with Him. The problem is we have an enemy. The problem is there's a, a struggle, there's a battle that we face. Which brings us to our last point, and that is that our relationship with Jesus rescues us. He rescues us. He refines us. He purifies us. He enables us and empowers us. And then he rescues us from something. Verse 6 says this, If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch and he withers. And they gather them, they throw them into the fire, and they are burned. A branch only has life as long as it stays connected to the vine. And for you and I, our only hope to have the abundant life that God calls us to, the abundant life that He says He wants us to have, our only hope is if we have an intimate, life-transforming relationship with Jesus. It's only if we stay connected to Him. Because if we don't, we're thrown aside like a branch and we wither, and someone gathers them, throws them into the fire, and burned. The emphasis is really clear here, that there are no true disciples who do not abide, who do not remain connected to Jesus. The branch has to remain connected to the vine, or it has no life and is of no lasting good. You guys have gotten flowers before, you've seen them. Right? They look really pretty when they're sitting in Trader Joe's. They look really pretty in, in Publix all out in the front. But you bring them home. We got some on our dining room table right now. You bring them home and give it two weeks and they're brown and they're wilty and they're dead. And you throw them in the trash and they start to stink. Or you throw them outside and they start to compost. Because they're not good for anything after they're dead. Because they're not connected to the vine anymore. That's not what the Lord wants of our lives. That's not what he calls you guys to. He does not want to see you wither and die in your spiritual life and ultimately in your physical life in eternity. He wants to see you connected to him, living an abundant life, a life that flourishes. So I believe the question for you and for even myself tonight is how are we going to continue to cultivate a relationship with Jesus that transforms us? How are we going to continue to abide and to remain in Jesus when the world around us and the flesh inside of us is calling us to the opposite? It's doing everything that it can, desperately trying to make sure that that doesn't happen for you and for me. 
We face an enemy. We face a battle. We face a real struggle that if you've walked with Jesus for any length of time, you know what this is life like. So maintaining your intimate, life-transforming relationship with Jesus is the only way that we can be rescued. A relationship with Jesus transforms you. How does it transform you? He refines us. He purifies us. He enables us. And he rescues us. Four ways that a relationship with Jesus is transformative in our lives. And Jesus is calling you to himself. He wants that relationship with you. If you don't have it at all, he wants to start. And if you do have it, he wants it to remain. He wants you to be who he created you to be and who he knows that you can be. If you submit to him, he is faithful to do all the things in your life that we've talked about tonight. So I don't think our God is a God of confusion. Right? He says that he's not a God of confusion. He, he tells us clearly what he does for us and how we can go about doing what he asks of us. It's really very simple. I and mean, we do it the same way that we cultivate any relationship. We do it the same way we go relationships and friendships that we already have. God has given us the tools to do it. The first step is beginning the relationship. The first step in how we cultivate this relationship is by answering the call. Some of you have done this already. Some of you are still working through it as you try to figure out, is God real? As you try to figure out, is the gospel real? The first thing we have to do is start the relationship. Answer the call. Believe in the truth of the gospel message. Believe that the scripture is real, that it's inspired by God, that it's trustworthy. It's something that is reliable and it has in it the means of life. And we can look at it and we can read it and we can believe what it says. We can pray to God that it would be applied to our lives. So you have to believe in the gospel message. Start that intimate relationship with Jesus. The second thing that we have to do is remember his abundant grace. This life is hard. The struggle is real. The battle that we face is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers of the air, the principalities of the air. And, and, and sometimes we sin, right? Sometimes we, we fail. I love what Phil said yesterday, if you were here on Sunday morning, that it's not, uh, it's not the sin that's the problem. If you struggle with sin, you're in a good place. Because if you don't struggle with sin and you're fine with it, that's the problem. But if you struggle with sin, you're in a good place. It means God is working in you to battle the flesh that's inside us and the evil spiritual powers that we battle against in this world. And when we fall, we have to remember that God has abundant grace in our lives over us. Because what Satan wants to do, what the enemy wants to do is take when we fail, to take when we, when we do kind of start to, to fade away or, or, or disconnect from God and we don't remain, we don't abide in Jesus. What he wants to do is say, man, God's really mad at you. You probably shouldn't come to him now. And you just keep drifting. You keep falling away from connection with Jesus. And if we can remember the grace that he has over us, if we can remember the way that he sees us, that when he sees us, if we're a son or a daughter of God, he sees the blood of Jesus cleansing us, purifying us. He sees his son when he sees us. We get that credit for his life. And so we can continue to come back to Jesus over and over and over again, even when we fall short of his glory. So answer the call, remember his abundant grace, and lean into his pruning. This is a hard one too. Right? Lean, when, when somebody, it's hard to stay in community sometimes when that community rebukes you, even though they're doing it out of love. It's hard to, it's hard to trust God even when things are, you feel like you look at your life and they're not going the way you want. It's hard to trust God when he's doing that pruning work in your life, when he's disciplining you and he's removing things out of your life uh, that, that you loved. It's hard to do those things, but continue to lean into his pruning. And then lastly, remain connected. And the way that you remain connected is the same way that you remain connected with any other relationship that you have, any other friendship that you have. We remain connected through prayer, through reading God's word, and through meditating on who Jesus is. We talk to our friends, do we not? Well, I talk to my friends. We talk to our friends, talk to Jesus. 
Talk to the Father. Talk through the Holy Spirit. Pray to Him. Speak about how you're going through your day. Just talk to Him whenever. Have that, that constant line of communication. We should pray without ceasing, says Paul. We should always just have a, an attitude and a heart posture that we are open in front of God. That we communicate with Him the good times, the bad times, the sad times, the joyful times. We praise Him. We ask Him for things. Talk to God. Secondly, we read His Word. We let Him speak to us. We listen to God. We talk to God and we listen to God. We see what, what He has to say. And we believe it and we trust Him because we trust His character toward us and His goodness and His love toward us. And lastly, we meditate on Him. We think about Him. I think about Kaylee all the time. She doesn't believe it. So one day I was like, I'm going to send you a period every time I think about you. <laughs> well, this isn't that funny. This isn't even my name. And then I forgot that day. And so <laughs> I said... <laughs> I sent her like no periods. And when she got home, she was like, <laughs> she actually, I don't, you've never stood like that, but, or not at me, but she was like, mm, I didn't get any periods today. I was like, oh, I was so busy. Uh, but I think about, I think about you, babe. I think about you. I done messed up. But we think about our friends as well. So we need to think about Jesus, have him on the, the forefront of our minds. Colossians 3 says that we set our minds on the things above. That's where, that's where our hope is. We need to set our minds constantly on the things of the Lord. Uh, Philippians says things, I don't have the verse, I'm going to butcher it, but things that are, things that are uh, righteous, things that are holy, things that are pure. These are the things that we should set our minds on and continuously think about these things. Think about Jesus uh, and his will toward your life. These are, are simple things. They're not easy things. Uh, but these are the ways that we cultivate this relationship that transforms us, that refines us, that purifies us, that enables us, uh, and that ultimately rescues us. And so let's pray and we'll get into our, our discussion for tonight. Lord, thank you for, uh, for this time. Thank you for this word. Uh, we ask that uh, your spirit has already um, begun to move in power through the truth of your scripture. We ask that you continue, uh, even after we go from here, to, to bring this uh, to our remembrance, to bring these truths to mind uh, and, and impress it upon uh, our hearts in a, way, in a way that transforms us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.